You're listening to a mighty fortress. Hello and welcome to Mighty Fortress. I am your host, Jake Zabel, the Knight of the Fortress. When the worries of the world are getting you down, oh, yeah, the world has got you down, and you want to and you don't know what to do. When the weight of the world is troubling you, and you need a break, you can come and find sanctity in the fortress, the Mighty Fortress. Now you may be interested to see the title of today's episode is called "Why I Am a Monarchist." Now, on this episode, I'm going to be talking about why I personally prefer to identify as a monarchist and why I think monarchy is a very good system of government. But mainly, this is just an excuse for me to talk about a very important doctrine, the doctrine of vocation. Um, I really want to talk about this um, situation involving the doctrine of vocation and government now that this weekend is our federal election here in Australia. And I think it's an important time to talk a little about what is our duty towards the government as uh, subjects or citizens of this country, and also what is the government's duty towards us. So I'm going to be talking about the doctrine of vocation. I'm going to be specifying about why I personally think that if we follow the doctrine of vocation correctly, why I think a benevolent monarchy is the best system of government. But before I get into all that, I just want to do a few little housekeeping things. So, first up is, for those who aren't aware, we've got our CLAM website, which is www.clam.info, that's C-L-A-M-M. That stands for Confessional Lutherans of Australia Media Ministry, because the Mighty Fortress is now part of my whole CLAM Media Ministry project that I've got going. And if anyone out there is interested in contributing to this media ministry in any way happy to have your help you can contact us at a mighty fortress podcast at yahoo.com.au that's our email address or you can go on to facebook and we've got an a mighty fortress facebook page and a clam facebook page you can contact us through either one of those i'm interested to get more people involved in this anybody who wants to do shows i'd be happy to have you you know if you can do a confessional lutheran podcast like a mighty fortress i'm happy to add it up there if you're a pastor and you record your own sermons, I've got a couple pastors that are already contributing their sermons to the CLAM website, and I'm happy to have more. Um, if you belong to a confessional Lutheran congregation somewhere in Australia, and you know that your church has a church website, uh, we have a links page on Almighty Fortress where we also have like different congregation websites. If you want your congregation's website up there, I'm happy to add it to the page. If there's any other way that you'd like to contribute to the site, if you've got like some sort of website that you want linked on Clam, we're happy to put it up there as well. Other than that, send questions and comments to Mighty Fortress. If you've got some comments you want to make about the show, if you've got some questions you want me to answer, I'm happy to answer them. You know, I actually would really love if people actually sent in some questions, asking me some theological questions. I'm happy to answer some questions. I'm hoping one day that I might even get someone like Greg Lockwood or John Kleinig on here just for a Q&A episode one day. So if you actually do have some questions that you want either me or a specific theologian like that to answer, just email the show at amightyfortresspodcast at yahoo.com.au Send me the questions and if you want me to answer them, I'll answer them. Um, if you want someone specific like Greg Lockwood or John Kleinig to answer your question, put that in the email. And next time I have one of those two pastors on this show, I will get them to answer the question for you. Apart from that, the other thing I'd like to mention is that there's the Confessional Lutherans Conference coming up. This is the Speak O Lord Conference. There was one done last year, um, organised by, I actually I don't know who organised it, but the speakers last year were Pastor Michael Lockwood, Pastor Gunther Barkovs, and Pastor Adam Hensley. Uh, they a very excellent conference. If you go to the CLAM website and you look for the conferences tab, you go down and you'll find the Speak O Lord conference from 2015. 
I got permission from them to add the audio to my website. So you can go to you can go to Clam and you can actually listen to the conference that they did last year. This year they have another conference coming up. So last year I forget exactly what the theme of last year's conference was. I think it was something to do with, like with biblical inerrancy or something. This year's uh, conference is going to focus on the theme of law and gospel. I'm not entirely sure of who's speaking at the conference and I'm not entirely sure of the dates. It's around October, November. Uh, I'm going to pop a link to that conference in the episode's detail below. So you can actually go there and you should be able to find all the details for the conference. Trust me, it's worthwhile going to and I'd encourage anyone out there to go to it. It's if it's anything like it was last year, it will be definitely worthwhile going to. The, apparently, I think this year they're doing one in Toowoomba and one in Tananda. So it'll be the same conference, same speakers, everything, but they're doing it on two locations so that more people can actually come to the conference. So that's the Speak O Lord conference for 2016. Uh, keep an eye out for it. I will pop the details below. And I recommend you go to it. And if you want to listen to last year's conference, you can find it on the website. Well, with that all taken care of, let's actually get on with today's episode. We've got this weekend our federal election coming up. And people will be asking, what do we do? Who do we vote for? What's my responsibility to do in this? I'm a citizen of this nation. What is my responsibilities? Who do I vote for? Which is the best government? Just in my own personal opinion... I don't really think democracy is all that great of a government. I mean, there's definitely worse governments out there, and democracy does have its benefits, but I personally prefer uh, monarchy. That's my own personal preference, and you can disagree with me. Some of you may love democracy. Some of you may hate democracy. Some of you may want a theocracy. That's where the church runs the country, such as, like, Vatican City. Um, some of you like, may want something... You may want a monarchy. You may want a dictatorship. I don't know. It's your own personal preference. I just personally prefer the idea of a monarchy. And the reason I prefer that is because I've come in recent years, thanks to my study here, my knowledge has grown and I've got a profound love and interest in the doctrine of vocation. The doctrine of vocation is that doctrine of what is my calling in life. And therefore, what are my rights and responsibilities in said calling? Um, the best book I can recommend for a very simple explanation of the doctrine of vocation would be Gene V's uh, God at Work. The doctrine of vocation pretty much is, it's a calling. What is my calling in life? And generally, this has to do with a lot of things, such as, if I'm a father, that's my calling. If I'm a son, that's my calling. If I'm a brother, that's my calling. There's also other things like what I'm called to be a citizen of this country. What is my employment? You know, what am I called to as an employee? And with this, what are my rights and responsibilities? With that, if you go to... Your, if everybody gets out your small catechism and you go right to the back of it and you find the table of duties, this is a good example of the doctrine of vocation because right here, Luther has put together a series of different Bible verses that tell us what are our rights and responsibilities in our calling and lives. Uh, the specific ones he has here are, you know, bishop, pastors and preachers, teachers, government, authorities, citizens, husbands, wives, parents, children, laborers, masters, servants or employers and employees, young people in general, widows and just Christians in general. The doctrine of vocation, like I said, it's my calling in life. The word vocation actually comes from, I think, the Latin word, which means calling. One of these days, I'm going to do a much more extensive episode on the doctrine of vocation. I also may actually do another episode where I get like a, th a theologian in who actually knows a bit more on the doctrine of vocation. Somebody who's done the research, because I think they could do a much better job than me. I've done a little bit of research in it, and like I said, I've found it... A great interest in my recent years because I think the doctrine of vocation it's one of those very important doctrines because it affects your entire life and like I said it gives you what are my rights and responsibilities so for example when we come to husband and wives what is your rights and responsibilities as a husband and a wife um, as the small catechism says quoting 
First Peter and Colossians says, For husbands, husbands, live considerately with your wife, bestowing honour on the woman as she is the weaker sex, since you are joint heirs of the grace of life, in order that your prayers may not be hindered. Husband, love your wives and do not treat them harshly. Um, the Ephesians verse that is not mentioned there is also, you know, husbands, love your wife as Christ loved the church and gave up himself for her. Uh, so in other words, husbands, love your wives, look after them, and if need be, you have to give up your life. A husband's calling in life is to take care of his wife. He is to look after her. He is to care for her. He is to treat his wife like God treats the church. And what are wives meant to do? Well, as it says here, You wives, be submissive to your husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are now her children, and if you do right, and let nothing terrify you. Also, as we've got in the Colossians and Ephesians, wives submit to your husbands because he is the head of the household. Now, this concept of headship and vocation, this will come up again when I point out why I think monarchy is the best system of government. A lot of people get very offended when you hear wives submit to your husbands, husbands are the head of the household. Many people get very offended by that and upset by that and that's because we live in this big feminist age where women have tried to become completely independent from men and look after themselves. But that's not the biblical way. The biblical way we're designed goes back to the Garden of Eden where man was created first and woman was created his helper. Man was the head of the household and woman was the body that was under the head. Now, many people will take this and go, oh, now you're just being sexist. You've just given all the power to the man. The man's in charge. He can boss everyone around. You're supporting domestic violence because you're saying that men can just be evil tyrants and rule their family. Yeah, no, that's a very negative caricature, and that's not the biblical view. The biblical view is wives submit to your husband. Yes, you know, wives should submit, but husbands are to be the head of the household as Christ is the head of the church. And in the same way that a wife must submit to a husband, it's the same way that Christians must submit to Christ. We don't argue with Christ. We don't try to set ourselves up as God. We don't try to take away that authority that does not belong to us. We submit to Christ. And that's actually the way that the Bible has structured the family and the household. Women submit to men. The husband is the head of the household. The wife's under him and then under them is the children. That's the order of creation. So it goes, the God the Father, Christ, husband, wife, children. That's the order of creation. And the thing that people don't understand here is that with great power comes great responsibility. Gotta love Spider-Man. Yes, the husband is the head of the household. And yes, that get, does give him a high level of power. But with that power comes responsibility. Yes, the husband is the head of the household, but that's not meant to be some great gift and benefit for him. That, in some ways, is a great burden on him because he's the head. He's the one who's responsible. He's responsible for the family. It's his job to make sure that everyone below him is taken care of. Like I said, the husband is the head and the rest of the family makes up the body. Yes, your head is in control of your body, but your head is also responsible for the rest of your body. Yes, my head controls my hand, but my head actually has to make sure that my hand doesn't get hurt. My head has to make sure that my hand is doing the right thing, that my hand is taken care of. My head is responsible for what happens to the rest of my body. Yes, it is in charge. Yes, it directs the body where it needs to go. But in order to do that, it needs to make sure that the body is kept safe and healthy. And that's how a marriage works. The husband is, yes, he's the head, but he's responsible for the wife. He has to take care of the wife. He has to look after the wife. Being the head doesn't mean that you're some tyrant that can just boss the family around and do whatever you please. No, as the head of the household, you have a great responsibility to take care of the household. Men, your job is to look after your wife and your children. Your job is to look after them. If you actually want to get married, you have a great responsibility to look after your wife and children. If you don't want to have that responsibility, then don't get a wife. If you don't want the responsibility of looking after a woman, then don't sleep with a woman. If you don't want the responsibility of looking after kids, then don't get a woman pregnant. Men, you have to have this responsibility. If you want to be a husband and father, you have to look after your wife and kids. If you don't want that responsibility, then don't become a husband or father. 
Stay away from women. That's what Paul says. And Jesus says that it is better for man to stay alone. Because in doing that, you don't have anybody to look after. And then you can devote your whole time to God. Paul brings it up. He says, you know, husbands have to look after your wives. And, you know, but it's better to stay single so that you can devote all your time to God. You can have all, you've got no responsibility. You've got nothing tying you down. You have to focus all your time on God then. But then Paul says, for those who can't control themselves and burn with lust, then they should go and get married so they don't, that they don't burn with desire and fall into sin. So... If you can't control yourself, go get a wife. And if you go and get a wife, you have to look after her. Wives, it is your duty to submit to your husband. But husbands, it is your duty to make sure that you take care of her, that you look after her. She's your responsibility and everything you do must be for her. And if a husband actually does that, and if a husband actually is caring for his wife, then she should be able to willingly submit to him. She should be willing, she should be able to trust him. Because if a husband is doing his job properly, then a woman should be able to trust that anything her husband does is for her benefit. Because everything the husband does is meant to be for the benefit of the family. Even if the wife may disagree with the husband at first. She should submit to him because she should be able to trust that what he is doing is for the benefit of the both of them and for their children. So in that situation, a wife should be able to willingly submit because she trusts her husband enough. She knows that her husband cares for her and that her husband loves her. Therefore, she can submit to him because she knows that any decision he makes is for their good. That is the calling of a husband and a wife. That is the doctrine of vocation. Husbands are called to have this responsibility. Women are called to, well, they don't really have the same level of responsibility. They have to look after kids. Women are above the kids. That's what we said, the order of creation, husband, wife, children. Both parents are responsible for the kids, but the head of the woman is the husband. And so he's also responsible for her. And then again, Christ who's the next level up, is responsible for all humanity. So he's responsible for both the husband and the wife. And that's how the order of creation goes. You have these different levels and different tiers of authority. And the higher you go up in authority, the more responsibility you have because the more people below you have to look after. And this is what leads us to now to the system of government. Because just as the husband is to be the head of the wife, so our governmental leaders are to be the heads of our nation. And so, what are the responsibilities for the government and for the subjects? Well, according to the Bible, uh, which, thanks, thanks to Luther, has been quoted here in the Table of Duties in the back of the small catechism. So I'm just going to read you the responsibilities uh, for the governing authorities. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist having been instituted by God. Therefore, he who resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur a judgment. He who is in authority does not bear the sword in vain. He is the servant of God to execute his wrath on the wrongdoer, and duties, of, duties subjects owe to their governing authorities. Render therefore to Caesar what is Caesar, and to God what is God's. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. I, therefore, one must be subject not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, for the same reason, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God, attending to this very thing. Pay all of them their dues, taxes to whom taxes are due, revere to whom revere is due, respect to whom respect is due, honor to whom honor is due. That's from Romans. The, the first quote above that was from Matthew twenty-two twenty-one. 21. This one was from Romans 13, 1 and 5 and 7. Uh, the next quote is, I urge that supplication, prayers, intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all men, for kings and all who have high positions, that we, that we may lead a quiet and peaceful life, godly and respectful in every way. 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2. Uh, and... Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for any honest work. Titus 3 verse 1. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or the governors 
as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and praise those who do right. 1 Peter 2 verses 13 and 14. Pretty much the government system is set up similar to the household. The government is the head. They have the power to look after the nation and they have the responsibility to look after the nation. And we as the subjects or the citizens of this country have a responsibility to be submissive to our governments and accept their authority. However, we do have the right to stand up against our authorities if they do the wrong thing. In Luther's small catechism, the fourth commandment tells us to honour our mother and father. Luther writes, what does this mean? We are to fear and love God so that we do not despise or anger our parents and others in authority, but respect, obey, love and serve them. So as subjects and citizens of this nation, our job is to respect, obey, love and serve those who have been placed in authority over us. And in the situation of government, that is our current prime ministers, premiers, uh, mayors, etc, etc. Those governmental authorities. And what are their responsibilities? Well, their responsibilities are to look after us, to take care of us, to fulfill God's will and do what is right. Yes, they, they bear the sword in a way. That's the separation of the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the right, which is God's kingdom, and the kingdom of the left, which is the kingdom of the world. And the kingdom of the left bears the sword in order to punish criminals and to protect the weak and everything, etc., etc. So the government has the responsibility to look after us. And you can go through the Bible and you can find heaps of places where the Bible actually tells us what the government is meant to do. If you go back to the old Levitical laws or whatever, it actually gives like a list of, I think it's in Leviticus. Don't quite remember. Somewhere in the Pentateuch, there's a whole list of things that kings are meant to do, such as kings aren't meant to be polygamous. They aren't meant to steal from people. They aren't meant to oppress their people. They're meant to look after their people. There's a whole list of how kings are meant to rule. And if you go and you look in the Bible, you also find that there are plenty of examples of good kings and bad kings. You know, David was a great king. And Solomon, while at the start of his, his rule was probably a good king, by the end of his rule was a horrible king. You know, kings like Josiah and Hezekiah that were great kings that served God and served their people. They had other kings like Jeroboam and Ahab and that who just oppressed the people and turned against God and led the people into wickedness. The head of any situation, whether that be the head of a family, the head of a church, the head of a nation, the people who are the head have a great responsibility. They must bear the weight of all the people below them. The head is responsible for the entire body. Yes, the head is in charge. Yes, the head gets to lead the body. Yes, the head has power, but it has that power to use it for good. Like I said, with great power comes great responsibility. If you are the head, you have to look after all below you. And this is why I actually think that the monarchy would be the best system of government. And that's a benevolent monarchy. And also maybe in Christendom, so a Christian monarchy. That if we have a monarchy, I think it should also be Christian, serving God and serving the people. Because we are actually instructed also that not to trust in princes. And Luther teaches us that... If the government is corrupt and if the government uh, forces us to disobey God or go against God's wishes, we are able to, to disobey our government in that sense. Such as in the Roman Empire, the emperors said that Christians couldn't be Christian and that they had to worship the emperor. We are actually able to disobey the government in that sense and worship God. And so if our government came down and forced us that we couldn't worship, we couldn't worship the Christian God anymore, we do have a right to react and reject that government. We can rebel against that. And if the government starts bringing in laws that go against our conscience and goes against the Christian doctrines, such as homosexual marriage, abortion, stuff like that, we are Christians are allowed to go against that and protest that and reject that because that goes against God's wishes. But there are other places where we don't really interfere. Like if the government wants to raise taxes or change the road rules or whatever, we don't protest those. We just submissively accept what the government is saying, hoping that the government is a good government and is doing it for our best wishes. Because if the government does their call, if the government fulfills their vocation properly, we can submit to our government. We can trust our government. 
Just as a wife can willingly submit and trust a good husband, so too can citizens willingly submit and trust a good government. If the government is doing everything right and the government is actually taking care of us the way they should be, we should willingly be able to submit. And if we lived in that kind of perfect situation, I do believe that in that sense, a monarchy would be the best because it's a single head. One person with all the power and all the responsibility. One person who's responsible for everybody. One person has to look after everybody. I mean, there won't be a democracy in heaven. In heaven, we will have the great triune divine monarchy ruling over us. The triune God will be the head in heaven and we will all submit to him willingly. And kings are meant to be that kind of representative on earth. David was God's representative to the nation of Israel. Our kings are meant to be the representatives of Christ on earth. They're meant to look after us the way that Christ looks after us. And so if we could have a benevolent Christian monarch, I do believe that that would be the best system. Now I keep throwing in the word benevolent and that's because monarchs, while I think monarchy is probably the best system of government, it's a very easily corruptible system. Why? Because we've given all the power to one person. And if that person uses it rightly, well, that's good. But if that person uses it wrongly, well, then we're all going to suffer. And so if that person was raised properly and taught properly and, you know, trained of how to be a good leader and how to fulfill their doctrine and how to fulfill their vocation as the king, then we could trust that person willingly. We could willingly submit to such a person because they'd be a good government. They'd be a good king. They'd be a nice, benevolent, ruling king that could look after us. But if they weren't trained properly... And they took all that power and they abused it and they treated us harshly and became an evil tyrant. Well, then that's not a good system of government at all. So I'm a monarchist, but I support the idea of a good, benevolent Christian monarch. Um, and if they're not Christian, well, you can have good secular government. But as a Christian, I would prefer to have a leader who is actually Christian and is doing God's will for our life and is serving God's kingdom. My view is I think a good benevolent Christian monarch would be the best system of government. It's better than democracy. We, we keep voting people. We give all this power to the citizens. Instead of having all the power in one head, we've tried to distribute all the power throughout the body. And the problem is the body disagrees with each other. You know, if a hand says, I want to be a foot, or the hand says, I'm better than an ear because I do things, or if an eye says, I'm better than the mouth because I can see... Or, you know, if people, when the whole body has power, the body disagrees with each other. The body has different roles. And if the body all tries to be equal, you're not going to get that. Not everybody is the same. Sure, everybody is an equal, everybody is an equal right. Everybody is equal with respect to God. Everybody is equal in respect to sin. Everybody is equal in respect to grace. But not everybody is the same. Everybody is different. And everybody does different things. And everybody has different gifts and specialities. We can't all do the same thing. We can't all work exactly the same, all produce the same. That was one of the main problems with communism, that it tried to make everybody exactly the same. We're not. We're all different. And that's why we need to have a head that controls the body. Because the hand and the feet, they don't work together if they're in control. You can't control a body if each body part wants to go its own way. You need one part in charge of everything. And with a democracy, that's kind of what we've tried to do. We try to give power to every individual. And the problem is everybody disagrees. And so what happens in the end is it comes down to majority rules. And if the majority of your nation is Christian, well, then that's good. But if the majority of a nation is not Christian, well, then that's bad. And even within Christianity, people disagree with each other. When it comes to something like abortion, that's a pretty debated topic at the moment. If a majority says, no, we don't want abortion, then we don't have abortion. But if a majority says, yes, we want abortion, then we have abortion. And so people then try to go, well, what's the right thing to do? Well, we don't actually get to know what the right thing to do is because it now just comes down to majority rules. Every individual has their own say and every individual can do whatever they want. And individuals will group together with like-minded individuals. And so it just depends on which grouping is more powerful than the other group. And so instead of having actual unity among a nation, we actually have disunity among a nation. Instead of everybody submitting under one head, everybody pairs off and fights among each other. 
And that's why I don't think democracy works as a good government, because all it does is it causes groupings and arguments and division. If we have a monarch, then we're either united under a good monarch or a bad monarch. The nation is united. Now, the leader can either be good or bad. The point is, I think we just really have to just accept the government that we live in. We just have to accept the government that is above us. We have to submit to a good government, and if the government does what is wrong and doesn't obey God's will, then we have to protest and stand up for it. We need to stand up for the church. We need to follow God first, and the government comes later as God's representative on earth. See, just one more thing that I'd like to point out when it comes to the monarchy versus democracy. Imagine it like this. Let's say there's 100 people in a room. Now, in order to get out the doorway, the best way to get out the door is for everybody to line up and go out single file. Therefore, there's always going to be someone ahead of you or someone behind you. Unless you're the last person or the first person, you're going to be following somebody and you're, someone's going to be following you. You're going to be submitting to somebody and you're going to have a power and authority over somebody. So that's the system, and monarchy is like that system. There's the first guy in charge is the monarch, and everybody behind him has their different level of order. The guy, second guy submits to the monarch, but he's in charge and responsible for everyone below him. Everybody has to willingly submit to the person in front of them in order to follow them out, and they're also responsible for everyone behind them. If someone in the middle decided to take a different turn, then everybody behind that person gets lost. Pretty much like if we were following this uh, lineup, so if the people got into a line of 100 people and they started trying to follow their way through a maze, if like halfway down the line somebody took a right instead of a left, well then the front is still going the right way, but the latter half is going the wrong way. So everybody has responsibility for the people behind them. They have to make sure that they follow the people in front of them and take care of the people behind them. That's how the ordering works. That's how authority works. You have power to lead the people behind you, but you have a responsibility to make sure they go the right way. Whether you are the head of a household, a church, or the country, you have a responsibility to take care of those who follow you. Now, with democracy, however, it's a little bit different because since we've tried to give everyone power, you're either going to go one of two ways. It's either going to be, okay, well, there's the door. Now, we've got to get out the door. Either everybody just scrambles and tries to push their way out the door, which just creates chaos, or people pair into groups and they try to go through the door in small groups, um, which just divides the whole room and nobody's working together apart from the small groups, or in like the sense of the communism idea of everybody is just equal and the same, those hundred people all link arms and they try to walk through at the same time. Well, the problem is a hundred people can't walk through a door big enough for one person. That's impossible. You can't fit 100 people through. Like I said, if the door is designed for one person to walk through, you can't even fit two people through at a time. You have to line up and go one at a time through the door. And so that's how I think, in just my own head, that's how I think the difference between monarchy and democracy. Monarchy is all about following the leader and taking care of those people behind you. Um, it's the doctrine of vocation, and if you understand the doctrine of vocation, if everybody did what they were meant to do, then we'd be better off. If everybody just if everybody just actually took responsibility for those below them and actually cared for the people, then we wouldn't have to worry. You know, if our leaders actually did the right thing for us, we could willingly submit to them because we know that they're good leaders. We could trust them wholeheartedly and let them lead us. And that works whether you're that works in every situation. In a, in a country, we have to trust our leaders to take care of us, and they have to be responsible and actually take care of us. In a church, we have to trust our pastors and our bishops to take care of us, to lead us, to pastor us and care for us spiritually, and they actually have to take the responsibility of going, they actually are dealing with people's souls here, so they are responsible for that entire congregation or that entire synod. If you're in charge of a church, you are dealing with people's souls and you have to take care of them. And in a household, women and children need to be able to trust their husband and willingly submit to his authority. Therefore, men need to step up, take responsibility and actually care for their wife and their children. Women wouldn't have to stand up against husbands if husbands actually just did the right thing. Yes, women need to be able to submit and trust. And here's another thing I want to point out. 
In the same way that I'm allowed to stand up to a corrupt government, in the same way that I as a citizen am allowed to go against a government who is not doing the proper thing, wives are allowed to do the same thing. So when I say wives submit to your husband, um, I'm painting, I'm saying that in light of a good situation where a husband can be trustworthy, where a husband can do the right thing, where a husband can be the head who looks after his wife. In that situation, women, you should definitely submit to your husband. You should trust him wholeheartedly. If your husband is a good man that takes care of you, you should trust him that you know that everything he's doing is for your good. But on the flip side, if your husband is some drunk dirtbag who, I don't know, hits you or cheats on you or just treats you poorly, you don't have to put up with that. I mean, like I said, just as I don't, just as I as a citizen don't have to submit to a corrupt government, wives don't have to submit to corrupt husbands. So if husbands aren't doing their job properly, wives don't have to submit. Um, in that situation, the wife has to stand up and actually go, okay, since you're being a bad husband, I'm going to stand up and have to actually take your position away from you. Hopefully that teaches the man to smarten up and actually go, okay, well, I've actually messed up and, you know, straighten his life out, take some responsibility, seek forgiveness from his wife and actually take care of her properly. And hopefully if the man straightens his life out, the wife should willingly forgive him and be able to submit to his authority again. It's the way this system works. We have responsibilities. We're to submit to those who are above us and we're to take care of those who are below us. So wives have to submit to the husbands, but wives have a responsibility to look after their kids. Husbands, because there's not really anyone above you apart from Christ, you should submit to God, and you also need to take care of your wife and your children. You have a responsibility. Um, I just want to make that point very clear. When I say wives submit to your husbands, husbands are the head of the household, I'm not being sexist. I'm not being chauvinistic or misogynist. I'm not supporting any kind of system where men are just the boss and in charge of anything. I'm not supporting domestic violence. I want to make that clear. The idea of the husband being the head of the household is not meant to be a violent, evil system. The husband is the head of the household is meant to be a great, loving, divine system. It's created by God. It was the way God established it in the garden, that man was made first and woman was created as his helper. Woman was created for man. She is his gift. She is his blessing. Husbands, you have the responsibility to love your wife, to look after your wife. And I just want to make this clear that when I say husbands are the head of the household, I just really want to emphasize that that's Men's being the head of the household means that they have a great level of responsibility. I just want to make it clear that male headship is not some oppressive patriarchal system. No, male headship is this system created by God that means that women are taken care of and that men actually have a responsibility to look after their women and children. Why do we actually say when like a boat is sinking or something, we get women and children on the boats first? If we lived in a system of evil, oppressive male patriarchy, then the men would just push the women aside, get on the boats and free and save themselves. That's not how it goes. Men are responsible for women and children. So they put them on the boats and the men sacrifice their own lives. Why in the past did it used to be only men that went to war? Because that was the man's responsibility to take care of women and children. Men gave up their lives in order to protect women and children. This is not some oppressive system. This is some system where men are actually willingly laying down their lives in order to take care of the women. This is a system that doesn't oppress women but raises women up. This is a system where men put themselves down in order to raise women up. That's the biblical system. Oh, I get so annoyed when people say that the headship of men is some kind of oppressive, patriarchal, anti-feminist system. A point I'm trying to make, and I'm sorry that I've gone off on a bit of a rant here now. I just want to make that male headship is not some oppressive, sexist, patriarchal system where men just get to boss women around and do whatever they want. That's an incorrect understanding of headship. Proper, biblical headship is where a man takes care of women and children at any cost of his own life. 
Men sacrifice everything in order to look after their wife. That is the responsibility of what it means to be the head of a household. You sacrifice everything in order to look after the wife and to look after your children. And if you don't want that responsibility, then don't get married. If you don't want to have to take care of a woman, then don't get involved with women. And I'm going this to everybody. Men out there that just sleep around with anyone they feel like it, no, that's not right. If you sleep with a woman, you take the responsibility of taking care of that woman. If you don't want to look after that woman, if you don't want to have anything to do with that woman, then don't have anything to do with her in the first place. Because if you get involved with that woman, she is now your responsibility. That is the doctrine of vocation. Where are you called to in life? What responsibilities do you have that in your calling? To be, if you become a father or a husband, you are responsible as a father and a husband. You are called to do the duties of a father and a husband. Now, I've pretty much exhausted this point and I've gone on and on about it. And I'm sorry that I've ranted over this. I just want to make myself clear and I just want to make this point clear because male headship has become one of the greatest things attacked since the rise of feminism. This concept of the evil patriarchy has been has completely attacked the church, has completely attacked the idea of male headship. If you want a good uh, video to go watch, go watch Lutheran Satire's latest video, A Christian and a Feminist Almost Agree. I'll pop a link to that video in the episode description as well. It's a good explanation for why male headship is not some kind of evil, oppressive system and what is the responsibilities of men. It's a very good video, I'd highly recommend it. I also recommend pretty much anything on Lutheran satire. Pastor Hans Feeney has actually done quite a lot of good work there and I'd recommend heaps of that stuff. Uh, but anyway, I've kind of gone more on a rant about um, male headship and the household more than I did actually going about monarchy and government, but I think it was all good topic. It's, it's all relevant to this concept of vocation. Um, I hope to in the future, whether it be next week or a few weeks time, actually do an uh, episode where I'll talk about vocation more specifically. And I do hope that in the future maybe I'll get a more learned theologian on to talk about the doctrine of vocation. Somebody who's actually researched a little bit more. It's a very important uh, doctrine. Uh, I'm only just getting into it, but I'm already very fascinated with it. And I actually think it's a very important doctrine. The doctrine of vocation deals with every aspect of our life and it's something that can be easily misunderstood, easily abused, but if done correctly, it's a great gift from God. And so to wrap up this episode, I just actually want to say a prayer for the upcoming election and for this nation and our government. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we pray for this federal election this weekend. Guide each of us as we cast our votes this weekend. Grant us wisdom and discernment so that we may choose good and wise leaders who hear your word, live your love, and care for the people and needs of this nation. We thank you for the gift of leadership and for all authority that you have placed over us. We ask that you will grant us the ability to accept those people that you have placed in authority over us, whether they be in the household, the church, or this nation. Lord, be with each and every one of us. Watch over this nation. Grant our leaders wisdom, and grant each and every one of us the ability to submit to our government. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Thank you for listening to this episode of A Mighty Fortress. 